And I want to share or begin a, a series of teachings that I haven't taught for probably about 10 years, so it was never taught in this church. And I want us to look at the subject, the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God. Because this is what this entire canon of Scripture is about. It is about a king and his kingdom. And Jesus said in Matthew 24, he said in the 14th verse, he said, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the earth, and then the end will come. And it is, as I've said on numerous occasions, it is time that the church understood the gospel of the kingdom because we have been busy with the gospel of the church for far, far too long. So I do encourage you to come on this journey as we discover what is the kingdom. When did it begin? When will it fully come? What will our part be in this kingdom? Now, in the age to come, and finally in eternity. So, make yourself comfortable. We'll be here a while. Turn with me, if you would, to the book of Daniel. You turned it just now. But I want us to look at Daniel chapter 2. And I'll just condense the first 23 verses for you. Nebuchadnezzar, who's the king of Babylon, has a dream. Israel, the northern kingdom, has been decimated and assimilated into the Assyrian Empire roughly 150 years before this event. The southern tribes of Judah and Benjamin, including Simeon, and the faithful of the northern tribes who came south and joined themselves to Judah have rebelled against God and the fulfillment of Deuteronomy 29 has come, sorry, Deuteronomy 28 has come upon them. They have been taken captive into a foreign land. The temple is in ruins. The city walls laid bare. The land, all but a few of the very poorest of the poor, empty. And Nebuchadnezzar has this dream, and the dream perturbs him, and he calls for all the wise men, the magicians, the soothsayers, to not only interpret the dream, but he says to them that you must first tell me the dream. Tell me what I've dreamt, and then give me the interpretation, and none could do that. And so he sent his captain to go and slay all the wise men of Babylon, and Ariel, the captain, pitches up at Daniel's house. And Daniel asks him for grace while he seeks the face of the only true God and that God would give the interpretation. And so we take up from verse 24. Then, therefore, Daniel went to Arioch, whom the king had appointed to destroy the wise men of Babylon. He went and said thus to him, do not destroy the wise men of Babylon. Take me before the king, and I will tell the king the interpretation. Then Arioch quickly brought Daniel before the king and said thus to him, I have found a man of the captives of Judah who will make known to the king the interpretation. The king answered and said to Daniel, whose name was Belshazzar, Are you able to make known to me the dream which I have seen and its interpretation? Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, The secret which the king has demanded the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, the soothsayers, cannot declare to the king. But there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets, and he has made known to the, to the king Nebuchadnezzar, sorry, he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar 
what will be in the latter days. This dream that Nebuchadnezzar dreams is the foundation to understand the kingdom of God. This dream will not be fulfilled in Daniel's lifetime, nor in the lifetime of Nebuchadnezzar, nor in the, the lifetime of the Babylonian Empire. It will be fulfilled in the latter days. And so Daniel begins to not only tell the dream, but interpret. And we take up from verse 31. You, O king, were watching, and behold a great image. This great image, whose splendor was excellent, stood before you, and its form was awesome. This image's head was of fine gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. You watched while a stone was cut out without hands, which struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed together and became like chaff from the summer threshing floors. The wind carried them away so that no trace of them was found. And the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. This is the dream. Now, we will tell you the interpretation of it before the king. You, O king, are the king of kings. For the God of heaven has given you a kingdom, power, strength, and glory. And wherever the children of men dwell, or the beasts of the field and the birds of the heaven, he has given them into your hand and has made you ruler over them all. You are the head of gold. Nebuchadnezzar, representing the Babylonian Empire, is the head of gold in this image that he sees in his dream. Verse 39, But after you shall arise another kingdom, the Medo-Persian Empire, inferior to yours, then another, Greece. A third kingdom of bronze, which shall rule over all the earth. And the fourth kingdom, which is Rome, shall be as strong as iron, inasmuch as iron breaks in pieces and shatters everything. And like iron that crushes, that kingdom will break in pieces and crush all the others. Whereas you saw the feet and toes partly of Pot of clay and partly of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, yet the strength of the iron shall be in it, just as you saw the iron mixed with ceramic clay. And as the toes of the feet were partly of iron and partly of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly fragile. The Roman Empire will be as strong as iron and fragile as clay. Like clay cannot adhere to iron, so there would be division in this empire it would, be have, it would have to be held together through force and power and then Daniel says in verse 43 as you saw iron mixed with ceramic clay they will mingle with the seed of men but they will not adhere to one another just as iron does not mix with clay and in the days of these kings in the days of these empires but specifically in the day of the empire with the iron mixed with clay, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed. God's kingdom will begin at the time of the empire of iron and clay. It has not begun yet. This is some 500 years, probably 550 years before Jesus Christ comes to earth. The kingdom of God has not come. It will come in the days of the kingdom of iron and clay. And Daniel says, God will set, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms. And it, the kingdom of God, shall stand forever. Inasmuch as you saw that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, 
and that it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold. The great God has made known to the king what will come to pass after this. The dream is certain, and its interpretation is true. God gives a Gentile king, at that time the greatest kingdom that the world has ever seen, gives him a vision of a glorious statue, a statue strong that is founded on iron. And Nebuchadnezzar is the head of gold, precious, valuable. And the Lord says in the vision that he will cut out of a mountain a stone. And that stone will strike the statue at its feet, where the iron and the clay are, will strike at the heart of Rome, and it will obliterate the statue. It will obliterate every kingdom, power, dominion of man. And as that kingdom grows, it will take over the entire earth. That stone will become a rock, will become a boulder, will become a mountain until it consumes the entire earth. And the kingdom that God sets up will reign forever and into eternity there will never be a trace of a human kingdom ever again. There will never be a kingdom that will be ruled by man. This stone that the chief builders rejected became the corner stone. This stone we're all confronted with, as, Matthew, as Jesus says and Matthew records, whoever falls on this stone will be broken. But upon whom this stone that God hews out of the mountain, upon whom this stone falls will be ground into powder. When Peter confessed that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, Jesus turns round to Peter and says, Blessed art thou, Simon bar Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Revealed what? That I am Christos. I am the stone that Nebuchadnezzar saw, whom Daniel interpreted. I am the stone, and upon this rock, well, Jesus first says to him, You are Petros. You are a pebble. And upon this Petra, upon this rock, this revelation, I will build my church. The church is built on the premise that Jesus Christ is the stone that will demolish every kingdom of man and will set up his own kingdom that will rule into eternity. He is the rock. He is the chief cornerstone. He is the rock that Moses took in the wilderness from which water sprung forth. He is the author and the founder of our faith. He's a sure cornerstone. We stand upon him. This is the vision that God gives to Nebuchadnezzar. And in it is summarized what the kingdom is. It is the eternal rule of God that will permeate the earth and into eternity and all mankind will be subject to it. It will not be given to men. The kingdom of God is not given to men. It is given to those who bow down to the king, to those who fall on the rock, Jesus Christ is the rock that all of us must confront. When we acknowledge Him as Lordship, we have to fall down and allow Him to break us. Break the sin, break the stronghold of pride, of arrogance. Allow Him to put us back together, to take out the heart of stone and give us a heart of flesh. We're all confronted with the rock Jesus Christ. Whoever falls upon him will be broken but be saved. But when he falls on you in judgment, he will grind you to powder. There is no saving. Only a certain assurance of eternal judgment. Now as we go into the New Testament in Matthew chapter 3, we meet the herald of the kingdom. The man who is appointed by God 
to bring the Jews to a place of repentance so that they can hear the message of the kingdom. Up until John the Baptist, the message of the kingdom has never been preached. It is prophesied. It is written about by the prophets of old. Isaiah speaks about it. David in his Psalms speaks about it. Ezekiel speaks much about it. Jeremiah speaks about it. Hosea, Amos, they speak about the kingdom. But that it's not understood by the Jews. And then God raises up a man by the name of John. And the Bible tells us in Matthew chapter 3, reading from verse 1, In those days John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It is imminent. It hasn't come yet. The kingdom comes when the stone strikes the feet of iron and clay. John's message, the kingdom of God is imminent. It is at hand. It is about to come. And his message, verse 2, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John prepares those who would believe to receive the king and then Jesus comes onto the scene and what message does he preach in the very next chapter chapter 4 we take up from verse 12 now when Jesus heard that John had been put in prison he departed to Galilee and leaving Nazareth he came and dwelt in Capernaum which is by the sea in the regions of Zebulun and Naphtali that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet saying the land of Zebulon and the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea, beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. And upon those who sat in the region and shadow of death, light has dawned. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. We go down to verse 23 of the same chapter. And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in the synagogues, and teaching the synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all kinds of sicknesses and all kinds of disease among the people. What did Jesus preach? The gospel of the kingdom. He taught about the kingdom, and he's most famous teaching that took place on a hill overlooking the Galilee, the Sermon on the Mount, he begins to teach his disciples about the kingdom. And in chapter 5, the Bible tells us that when he saw the multitude or seeing the multitude, he went up on a high mountain, or sorry, on a mountain. And when he was seated, his disciples came to him. Then he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And throughout the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus teaches about the kingdom, parable after parable, instruction after instruction. The kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking to find a pearl of great price. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who finds a treasure in a field. The kingdom of heaven is like a man going out to sow seed. The kingdom of heaven is like. The kingdom of heaven is. This is how the kingdom works. The kingdom, the kingdom. This was the message of Jesus Christ. It was the kingdom of God. It was the fulfillment of Daniel chapter 2. He began, not, sorry, that's incorrect, not the fulfillment, but he was introducing the Jews to the kingdom of God. Until that point, they understood the Mosaic law. They understood that God had a special place for the children of Israel that God had given them land and a capital city which God would watch over. But the kingdom was different. The message of the kingdom was very different to the message of Moses, to the law of Moses. The law of Moses centered around a nation and a city. The kingdom of God focuses on a heavenless, heavenly city, an eternal kingdom, one that will cover the, all, the whole earth, one that will separate humanity into those who bow or fall on the rock 
and those upon whom the rock shall fall. And so Jesus said in his sermon, chapter 5, verse In chapter 5, sorry, where is that scripture? Verse 20, sorry. Why am I apologizing? For I say to you, that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the, of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom cannot be entered into through the law of Moses. You cannot observe the Mosaic law and rely on the blood of animals to make atonement for your sin in order to enter the kingdom. The kingdom can only be entered into by and through the king. Your righteousness must exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. Well, how righteous were the scribes and Pharisees? Concerning the law, they sat in Moses' seat. They were the example of how to fulfill the law by the letter, but not in the spirit. And so what Jesus does as he expounds his teaching on the kingdom, on the Sermon of the Mount, he begins to reveal to the Jews the spirit behind the letter. You have heard it said, you shall... Love? Sorry? Love your neighbor but to hate your enemies. Yet I say to you, love your enemies. You've heard it said that whoever commits adultery should be stoned to death, but I say to you, whoever looks at a woman to lust after her has already committed adultery in his heart. What the Lord does is he removes the blindfold that the Jews had been under. They followed the law, the letter of the law, without considering the God who gave the law, without considering the heart of God. Your righteousness must exceed that of the scribes and Pharisees. You cannot rely on observance to law, and specifically the Mosaic law, to enter the kingdom. How then do we enter the kingdom? Well, Jesus says in Matthew chapter 11, speaking of the ministry of John, Matthew chapter 11. I'm laying a foundation. Next week we will get into the meaty stuff of the kingdom and we shall remain in the meat for a while until we are transformed, until we have a grasp of what the kingdom is so that our Christianity can, come, can be transformed from a, a churchianity to a kingdom mindset. Matthew chapter 11, reading from verse 1, Now it came to pass when Jesus finished commanding his twelve disciples that he departed from there to teach and to preach in their cities. And when John had heard in prison about the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said to him, Are you the coming one, or do we look for another? This is a fascinating comment that John makes. Are you the coming Christ, or do we seek another? We read earlier in in, John, sorry, in Matthew chapter 3, that God raised up John the Baptist as a forerunner to the Messiah. He's prophesied of by Isaiah. And John, who acknowledged that Jesus was the Savior of the earth, the Lamb of God, asks the question of Jesus, are you the Messiah? Did I miss it? Why was John questioning his own revelation that God gave him regarding Jesus? It was John who acknowledged that Jesus was the Christ. He said of, of Jesus that he must increase and I must decrease. And now, sometime later, John in prison sends his disciples to ask Jesus, are you the coming one? Or is there someone else that we should await? What happened to John? Thrown in prison, life threatened, yes. But how does that affect him? Why does he then question whether Jesus is the Christ? Jesus 
Well, that's right. The, the expectation of John was that Jesus would march into Jerusalem, overthrow Pontius Pilate, and establish his kingdom and the kingdom of Christ, like the kingdom of David and the kingdom of Solomon before, would then begin to influence the earth. And when Jesus did not fulfill the expectation of John and the ex expectation of man, they all turned on him. Because they did not understand that in order to enter the kingdom, a price would have to be paid. There is no entering the kingdom without a price being paid because the kingdom could not be established until a price was paid. The kingdom was birthed on the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Without his resurrection, without him becoming the firstborn from the dead, the kingdom of God could never have been established. At best, we could have lived on a recreated earth, partaking the tree of life for eternity, with God coming through the person of Jesus in the cool of the day and chatting with us on occasion. Do we seek another? Jesus responds in the fourth verse and he says, Go and tell John the things which you hear and see. The blind see and the lame walk and the lepers are cleansed. And the deaf hear, the dead are raised up and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he who is not offended because of me. Blessed is he who is not offended because of me. John was offended because Jesus did not meet John's expectation. Like many Christians get offended when Jesus does not meet your expectation. When you pray for something and the Lord withholds or does not grant your request, many of us become offended with Jesus because we expect Jesus to conform to our image of him. Most of us have a problem with the second commandment that God gave to the Jews where he said you shall make no likeness of, of, of any image of God. Do not make a God for yourself, even an image of the true God. Yet most of us subconsciously have created an image of God according to what we believe God should be. And when the Lord does not respond to us as we believe he should, and God does not behave as we believe we should, or sorry, he should, then we become offended. Because we don't understand the king or his kingdom, we're still looking for an earthly deliverer. We're still looking for peace and health and prosperity in this fallen world. Satan is the god of this world. What peace do you think you're going to find? Verse 7. As they departed, Jesus began to say to the multitudes concerning John, What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? But what did you go out to see? A man clothed in soft garments? A delicate man? A kind, sweet, gentle man? A soft man that rides his bicycle with a little basket in the front doing home visits and you put eggs and muffins and all things. What did you go out to see when you saw John? Indeed, those who wear soft clothings are in king's houses. But what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I say to you, and more than a prophet. For this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your, before your face, who will prepare your way before you. Assuredly, I say to you, among those born of woman, there has not risen one greater than John the Baptist, but he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Of all those born of woman, Moses, Elijah, Daniel, Miriam, Hannah, David, Of all those born of woman, none 
is greater than John the Baptist. John the Baptist, according to Jesus Christ, was the greatest prophet that ever lived. Was a man who walked after God more than any other man that has ever lived. Of all those born of woman, none is greater than John the Baptist. But he, who's the least in the kingdom, is greater even than John. Could you imagine if the church believed that? Why or how can one who is least in the kingdom be greater than John? Because many of us feel that we are least in the kingdom. How on earth and in God's economy can we be greater than John? That's right. Because John was born of a woman only, as was David, as was Solomon, as was Miriam, as was Hannah, as was every saint of the Old Testament. They experienced one birth, one death. We experienced two births and one death. As Jesus said to Nicodemus in John chapter 3, Jesus said to Nicodemus, and it would benefit you if you turn there, if you are not familiar with this portion of Scripture. Keep your place in Matthew 11. But Jesus said to Nicodemus, he said these words in John chapter 3, reading from verse 3. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Unless one is born again, you can't be born again until you're first born. You're born once and then you're born again. Unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom. Nicodemus, a Pharisee, acquainted and expert in the law, said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born thinking in the natural obviously impossible and Jesus says to him in the fifth verse most assuredly I say to you unless one is born of water and the spirit he cannot enter the kingdom of God that which is born of the flesh that which is born naturally is natural is flesh but that which is born of the spirit is spirit do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. You cannot enter the kingdom of God unless you are born again. Not born naturally for a second time, because that is impossible. But to be born of God under the Mosaic law, up till and including John the Baptist and the thief on the cross who died next to Jesus, up until that point... You could not be born of the Spirit of God because the way had not yet been made. You could be righteous under the law, a righteousness that was not the righteousness that you and I have in Jesus Christ. It was a righteousness by faith through obedience. But you and I are born again through the grace of God that God took on the form of a man, went to the cross and he paid the price for our salvation, our justification, our sanctification, and our total redemption. And it is through faith in the work of the cross that we are born into a kingdom, not into Israel, not into Moses, but into 
this kingdom that God showed a pagan would be birthed at the time of the greatest empire known to man. Man's greatest demonstration of power would be eclipsed by God as that which was wise and mighty in the mind of man was eclipsed by that which was foolish. God taking the form of a man, hanging on a tree, and is thus doing, establishing a kingdom which is eternal. We go back to Luke 11. Sorry, Matthew 11, thank you. Just want to show you that I am fallible. And after Jesus said that, Assuredly, I say to you, among those born of women, there has not risen one greater than John the Baptist, but he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than John, or greater than he. The Lord then says this in verse 12, and, when, and from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers a violence, and the violent take it by force. A very difficult portion of Scripture to understand because of two words, or one word used twice. Biazzo and biastis. Now we're not here to learn Greek, but a, a basic understanding of these words is helpful. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven, bias, biazzo, and the biastis enter in. The word biazzo, the Greek word that my Bible translates as suffers violence, is used only one other time in Scripture. It's used in Luke's account, in Luke 16, verse 16. And here Jesus says that the kingdom of heaven in Luke 16, and, he, and the translators translate Biazzo as press in. That we need to press into the kingdom. From the days of John the Baptist, John begins to preach the kingdom is at hand. Those who enter the kingdom are those who are prepared to press in. You don't go willy-nilly dancing into the kingdom. Tra-la-la-la-la-la-la, I'm going to the kingdom of God. da 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 Or as we say in South Africa, sunshine, Breifles and Chevrolet. You have to press into the kingdom. It's going to require your very life is going to require everything you have. It's going to require all your energy. It's not something you join. You don't join the kingdom. You don't sign up to the kingdom. You die to enter it. You press in. You lay hold of. You give your life for it. You consider the cost. And if you're willing to pay the cost, you could enter. Because until, from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven is pressed into. And the biastis, the passionate, take it by force. Not the willy-nilly, half-hearted, compromised. It is those who are passionate, those who have been touched by the Spirit of God, those who have been made alive to God and the Spirit of the living God indwells them, who have counted the cost and have chosen to forsake the world. It is those and those only who press into the kingdom. The kingdom of God is not like the Mosaic law. If you were a Gentile, you could join with Israel as a multitude did when God took Israel out of Egypt. And they joined themselves to Israel. And they were given the grace under the Mosaic law to live as a citizen of the land and to reap the benefits. All you had to do was follow. And it made sense because if you followed God and you followed the Mosaic law, then your crops would be abundant, your animals would reproduce abundantly, there would be blessing and goodness upon the land. It was a win-win situation. It didn't cost you anything but a pain at circumcision. No more sweet and sour pork, but other than that, you were introduced to good food. But it didn't really cost you much. And the benefits were obvious and the benefits were immediate. 
But that wasn't the kingdom. That was not the kingdom. That was the law of Moses, a temporary dealing with the Jews until the king of righteousness would come, as Paul writes in Galatians. Until the righteousness through Jesus Christ was established, the Jews were kept under a tutor. But the kingdom of God brings instant salvation, but with its suffering and hardship. And one has to understand the kingdom to be willing to pay the price because it'll cost you everything. And you have to be committed to it. Because the opposition from the enemy is not only real, but it is consistent. But those who enter the kingdom, even the least, is greater than John. And how does our righteousness exceed that of the Pharisees? We have to be born again. Do we birth ourselves? No, it is a mysterious work of God. It is a mystery. Christ in you, the hope of glory. It was something that was hidden, not only from Satan, but the very angels of God desired to look into the mystery of salvation. Even the angels do not grasp the mystery of salvation, for it is beyond their understanding. That through an an act of God's mercy that took place 2,000 years ago, a person today, through simple faith that God gives them to believe the gospel message, can be instantly transformed and become a new creation. This is mysterious. mysterious. This is amazing. It is the work of God. And not only does our righteousness then exceed that of the Pharisees through no act of our own, through no act of our own, but through the cross of Jesus Christ and the grace of God that was freely poured out, but our righteousness both exceeds that of the Pharisees, and as Paul writes to the Corinthian church in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21, a portion of Scripture that by now you should all be familiar with, where Paul reminds the Corinthians that God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we, we who believe, we who have bowed our knee to his lordship, we have said we are going to press in that we may obtain this kingdom, that we might become the righteousness of God in Jesus. When you have the righteousness of God, that surely exceeds the righteousness of the Pharisees and Sadducees, does it not? It is His righteousness. Unless a man, and that applies to a woman as well, is born again, they shall not see the kingdom. The gospel of the kingdom begins at salvation for you and for I. It is not the kingdom. Salvation is not the kingdom. But unless we are born again, unless the Spirit of the living God comes and indwells us and separates us from the world, gives us a new heart, a new spirit, a new identity that we cry out, Abba, Father, unless we have encountered the working of the Holy Spirit in the rebirth, we cannot see the kingdom. But being born again is the gateway to the kingdom. We need to continue the journey Because Jesus Christ did not die just so that you could miss hell. He came to establish a kingdom. There is a whole, whole lot more that the church does not speak about. The gospel of the church is come to Jesus Christ, give your heart to him, and you'll be saved. There's nothing wrong with that. For unless a man is saved, he, he will not see the kingdom. So the gospel of salvation is important. But the gospel of salvation without continuing to the gospel of the kingdom, leaves the church powerless, 
susceptible to deception, and generally not understanding what the purpose is of being a Christian. Come to Jesus, you'll be saved. Give one tenth to the church and sit down. Jesus is coming back soon. What do you do in the meantime? What is heaven? Do we get issued a harp, a cloud, and told to sing hymns for eternity? Because if that's the deal, I want to tell you it's not that appealing. Well, compared to being eaten by worms and burnt, and yeah, it's a whole lot better. But really, do you really want to play a harp for eternity? But that's what the church teaches. And that's why people are half-hearted, cold in the church, without purpose, without direction, without passion. So, the kingdom of God would be established at the time of the Roman Empire. It was. Greece is no more a world power. In fact, they're indebted to the EU. Babylon, what's left of it? Modern-day Iraq, decimated. Medo-Persia, Iran, not what it used to be. Rome still lives, and she's powerful. Don't think Italy. Think the Roman Catholic Church and all that is affiliated to her. She is powerful. She lives. Yes, it's clay and iron. Many nations trying to enforce the beliefs of Rome. The Lord started with Rome and he'll end with Rome. We are living in, we're still living in the days of the Roman Empire. That empire has not been defeated. It has transitioned from a, a military might to a geopolitical and religious organization. And she is getting stronger. But she will be decimated. We enter the kingdom through faith in Jesus Christ, the King of Kings. Next week, we're going to look at what is the kingdom. Any questions?